Well, good evening, this is Paul Fletcher, member for Bradfield, and we're kicking off the Telly Town Hall with my guest, Warren Mundine. Thank you. Welcome, Warren. Very pleased to have you here. Now, uh, for those who are joining us on the Telly Town Hall, uh, this is a the equivalent of a traditional town hall meeting that we're conducting it over the telephone, which will give a lot of people the opportunity to listen and to ask questions. Uh, if the call drops off um, during the town hall, you can call back by dialing 02 8317 3687. Uh, and of course, we're also uh, live streaming this on Facebook. So this Tele Town Hall is the first of two that I'm going to be holding, and it's the opportunity to have a discussion about the voice and what it's going to mean. And I'm really very pleased that we're joined by a young guy, Warren Mundine, AO, a very distinguished Australian. So, uh, Warren, if I could welcome you to the Bradfield Tele Town Hall. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here as well. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, do uh, uh, welcome the country uh, and. Uh, and and uh, pay respects to the traditional owners of the area uh, and also traditional owners across Australia. Terrific. Well, thank you, Warren. So we're going to have a chat about uh, the, the voice, the voice to Parliament, what the proposal might mean. And perhaps if you could start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your background. You're a very well-known Australian, but uh, just a few key points. Uh, yeah, well, just a couple of key points is... Uh, my family, I have a, actually a, a photo on my computer and, and my iPhone and, and iPad, which is a photo of my father as a baby. And we're guessing it was about 1916, 1918, in that period, around the end of the First World War. And, uh, and it's on the Yugal Bar cattle station where my father grew up and, and my family worked on it. And it's a, and it's a family gathering, There'll be 30 or 40 people in that photo. Uh, but for me, it's really an important reminder of where I come from, uh, that I come from people who, that transitional uh, generation, that they were living in humpies and that, mm. and then moving into the modern world during the 20s and 30s, and of course, my father off in the Second World War. And, and so I always look at that photo, and I just think about the amazing life that they would have had, and, and, and the morals and, and work ethic and other things that uh, they taught me uh, which you know got me to where I am today. That's a that's a terrific uh, background for those who are just joining uh, you're with Paul Fletcher a member for Bradfield and Warren Mundine and we're talking about The Voice so Warren can you start by perhaps briefly explaining what The Voice is intended to do? Well the idea behind The Voice uh, was uh, and it's been discussed for quite a while uh, was about ha ha having Aboriginals be listened to and being able to uh, talk to government and at you know, federal and state levels and, that, and having a, a, a strong input into uh, what policies uh, and, and legislation and that needed uh, to, to be created and done to actually closing that gap uh, which in the last few years had been going backwards, mm -hmm. and so um, so that was that's the intention, of course. And the other, the big one, of course, is putting it into because we've had advisory groups before, but the big one is putting it in the constitution. And the background for that is they believe is that it uh, it stops governments and, and can change in governments who would then actually uh, you know close down uh, the, uh, that voice as they call it. Uh, that council, whatever it is, uh, that will that will be advising uh, government and also the uh, the executive. Um, okay, so that that's the kind of theory of what it's intended to do. Now you touched on this, but the the forthcoming referendum will propose that this be established through a change to the constitution. So if people vote, if if enough people vote yes, there will be a change to the constitution. What is the significance of the voice uh, being established? in that way through a change to the Constitution? Well, there's a couple of myths in the whole process. One is that Aboriginal people uh, haven't got a voice. As you know yourself, you see Aboriginals mm. in, in the Parliament all the time and over the years. In fact, currently we have the Coalition of the Peaks, which sits at the National Cabinet with the Premiers and Chief Ministers and the Prime Minister. 
uh, and they advise uh, government on, on what policies, or not just only advise waiting for the government to come up with ideas, but also giving some, putting forward ideas as yep. well in that process and that. The difference now, what they're putting forward is actually having a body like that within the constitution, which uh, opens it up to a, a wide range of other issues in regard to that. And, and of course, we've, you know, so I can understand why people are a bit confused out there because we have a sort of a smorgasbord of uh, legal advice coming from former chief justices, justices and lawyers and judges and everyone else and constitutional lawyers and that about what that really means. But one thing they do all agree on is that when it's in the constitution, like the College of the Peaks, the government can just now just close that down. Mm -hmm. What they all agree on is that once it's in the constitution, then it's going to, it's going to be um, a really open the door for the arbitrator of the constitution, which is the High Court. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. For those who are just joining, uh, it, you're joining Paul Fletcher, uh, your Bradfield Member of Parliament uh, chatting with Warren Mundine about the voice and uh, what it would mean. Warren, of course, a very distinguished Australian and a, a leading advocate for the, the no position. So you've talked a bit about how it's th what's going to be put to the Australian people is that the voice be established through a constitutional provision. Uh, could it be done in other ways? Oh, there's a lot of ways of doing it. Because you, you look at... Uh, these are the concerns I have, is, is that you... You've, got a, you've had advisory bodies yep. going back to the 1970s. Uh, you've had and, and, and a, a very a whole wide range of them. In fact, I, I chaired a, a non-representative advisory board which was set up by Prime Minister Tony Abbott and then uh, reappointed by uh, Prime Minister uh, Malcolm Turnbull. Now, we were an expertise type body we, and we always uh, said that we weren't a representative body. But this one, uh, the, like the Coalition of the Peaks, currently is, is a representative body of all the, um, uh, uh, the community Aboriginal organisations. They sit at that table and, and, and give that advice. Uh, the issue we hear is if we put an advisory committee, and these are the words of the, of the Prime Minister, we put an advisory committee in the, the Constitution, what's the difference between that and the current mm -hmm. advisory committees? And, and this is one of the problems with when the government and, and also the, the Yes Chem, Yes 23 campaign people uh, get in trouble, and this is why the polling's low for them at the moment, is people are asking for detail. If you say it's going to be different, and, and, and what the Prime Minister said and the Minister for Indigenous uh, Australians in earlier this year in, in uh, Alice Springs about, oh, OK, we, these things wouldn't happen if we had a voice, well, people say, well, explain to us how, how it's not going to happen and and they, and they keep on falling back on the details of the after the year mm -hmm. after the uh, referendum has been voted on and of course after the referendum under the thing it's about the parliament will be setting up what the voice is after that referendum but people are saying if we're going to vote for it we'd like to have a, a good clear idea of how it is going to close those gaps and yes. how it is going to stop things from happening yeah so uh, in other words, it could be established I in other ways, if yes. I'm hearing you correctly, and, and you pointed some other bodies that yeah. uh, operate that don't have a constitutional basis. Well, the first question I, 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 I uh, sent to the Prime Minister and, and the Minister of Indigenous uh, uh, Australia after the Alice Springs was, if you believe that, well, why don't you, because you've got the legislative power now within the Constitution, mm -hmm. why don't you do that now? and then people can see how it works, how it operates and that. Yeah. And also, uh, people can also see, like even if it's perfect, I always said even if it's perfect, you're still gonna have bugs in there. Yeah. And so how can how can we work on that? Uh, then the government, of course, has refused to do that. So, and so we're in this situation at the moment. Yeah. Um, the, as you've talked about, the stated rationale is to um, help close the gap, help address Indigenous disadvantage, and we know that there is significant Indigenous disadvantage. Um, what other ways are there, in your view, uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to address uh, decision-making by government um, uh, and, and target that issue of disadvantage? Yeah, well, I, I have, you know, 
uh, four titles mm. of which uh, I, I talk about. And one is accountability, the second one is education, the third one is uh, uh, economic participation, which is about a job and and investment and business, and and the and the fourth one, which is really in, uh, going to be a, a tough thing to struggle with, and that's dealing with the socio economic problems within those communities. So you're looking at crime rates, you're looking at uh, 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 you're looking at a uh, whole heap of social issues, you know, domestic violence and so on and so on. The list goes on and we and we've read about these reports every six months about what's happening in these communities. Now, going back to the, the first one, uh, uh, you know, we're spending, uh, you know, what, three and a half to four billion dollars directly to Aboriginal communities mm -hmm. every year. And so that, if, if, if and we're not getting the results that we um, uh, want to get, then shouldn't people be held accountable for it? We need, and one of the things with uh, uh, Prime Minister Abbott and Prime Minister Turnbull thing we looked at was, okay, what we should be putting outcomes for, in front and not, uh, and, and then making people uh, accountable for getting those outcomes. You set the time frames, you set the budgets and, and, you, and you set the targets and that and you do. The problem we have at the moment, we get the Closing the Gap report uh, every year really great report really great statistics and we also get the productivity uh, reports as well but they they so, seem to sit on the uh, on the parliamentary table and and there's no real accountability and no real focus on those outcomes mm -hmm. that. now that's not the problem the counter uh, that's not the problem problem with the coals and the peaks or the, or the or the productivity commission because they've done a really good job it's just that okay what do we how do we fix these things and the other th uh, thing I talk about is education uh, education is key I don't know any uh, civilization or group of people in the history of the world that ever lifted themselves out of poverty and brought them into a, a, you know a mainstream modern society and that without uh, education mm -hmm. and and so that's so we the problem we're having is that we're having kids uh, in some of these remote and rural areas that you're getting attendance rates variable from 25% to 70%. Yeah. That is just not uh, that's just not sustainable, and it's not going to help those communities. Uh, and then, of course, the, the third one is what uh, the Turnbull and Abbott government did. Uh, when they brought up with the, the Indigenous procurement policy. Yep. It's one of the most successful policies I've seen in, in my life in regard to uh, Indigenous affairs. Uh, it, it started off with a $6.2 million contract. They have to be on merit, they have to deliver something. If it's a tank, they've got to deliver the tank yes. on Monday working and everything yes. like that. And and what's happened with that has gone for $6.2 million in the 1st of July 2015. It's now worth that in indigenous uh, business economy is now worth $8.7 billion. So in that seven year, eight year period, it's jumped to that. Yep, yep. And then uh, through that 45,000 Aboriginals have, and Torres Strait Islanders have, have got jobs uh, and 37% of those have uh, actually got jobs in regional and remote Australia. Now, uh, that has just been a, a, a huge, incredible phenomenon. We still, we also worked on, uh, of course, you have this bizarre situation where our Aboriginals are living on Aboriginal land. 55% of Australia's land mass is owned by Aboriginal people at yep. the moment, yep. uh, mainly for native title and land rights, some people for purchases and so mm -hmm. on, but that's the bulk of it. And over probably the next 10 years, you're going to get to about 70% of Australia's land mass is going to be under Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander control. The problem that was there was it's it's in, in a title that doesn't encourage economic development yeah. and yep. that and, and people are finding it very hard and they've tried me, over many years banks and in, mm. investors to try and get around it so we had the bizarre situation where we had people say working in the mining industry you got on a hundred thousand dollars a year 150 or two hundred thousand dollars a year and they couldn't own a home yeah okay and yeah. It, so and we all know from economics 101 that you know if, if your parents own a home it's a start of, of uh, economic prosperity with assets yeah. uh, and and there's a, a really uh, 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 
chance that the children will own homes, yes, and yes. then the grandchildren will own, yeah. and then the great grand, and then you get this flowing effect. The other part of that is by that land ownership. You could actually then start uh, looking at um, you know how do you get investments. In yes. fact, I read a paper in April this year uh, for the Centre for Independent Studies, and we compared town, uh, towns of two thousand people. Yep majority Aboriginal in, in one set of towns and a majority of non-Aboriginals in another set of towns. And we looked at it and in the, in the non-Aboriginal majority towns you'd have a service station, you'd, yes. you'd have a, a IGA type store, mm. you would have a hairdresser, you would have probably a pub and accommodation mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. things like that. You would have tradies and, and that working there. In the Aboriginal towns, uh, it, the vast majority was it was a government store. Yeah, so that, that's a very interesting contrast. For those who are joining, uh, it's uh, Paul Fletcher, member for Bradfield, chatting with Warren Mundine about The Voice. Warren's just been answering a question I asked about Indigenous disadvantage and ways to address it and where The Voice might fit in. Um, for those who want to ask questions, we've already got a few questions queued up and we'll be getting on to questions from those participating in the meeting uh, a little later on. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask you, Warren, um, amongst Indigenous Australians, and I know it's very difficult to generalise, yeah. but what's your assessment of views about the voice? Is it, is it something that's widely supported? Is it something where there's a, a diversity of views? Uh, look, I find that uh, it's mainly about uh, geography, yes. where people are living. Yes. Uh, uh, you know, you'll have people in the cities and that who will be... Uh, who would know? <coughs> excuse me. Who would know about the voice and that? Mm. But from my travels across the country, I'd love to see there being a, a no, no campaign and say, mm. "Oh, mate, they're all going to vote no." And the actual fact that's not true. The, mm. one, the facts are that, and I, I looked at the Get Up, uh, uh, the uh, poll they did. With mm. Get Up's not my friend, but yeah. they they come out with similar conclusions that we had, which is about forty five percent of Aboriginal people uh, uh, were never heard of the voice mm. or they have heard of the voice but they don't know what it d does yes and then there's another 25 percent uh, uh which is going to vote no and there's probably 30 percent who's going to vote yes but there's probably other people in there who quite haven't made up their mind or welded on yet to okay. either side okay. yeah. so that's that's my mm. uh, you know looking at that and looking at the polling uh and so um and, and it's funny it's it's across a lot of communities across Australia who are in different parts of you know, the rural and regional Australia are in the same boat and then you've got the people even in the suburbs. I, I have this little joke where I got in a taxi and asked this taxi driver about the voice and he said, he said, my kids watch that show, I don't. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. so, the, so, and also we know, and we've been through this ourselves, mm. uh, Paul, is that People really don't focus on these issues until you're about six weeks yeah. out or four weeks out yeah. from an election. Yeah, I okay, know that's a good point. Yeah. Um, so uh, you're, we're, we're going, we're holding the Bradfield Tele Town Hall. It's uh, Paul Fletcher, member for Bradfield, chatting with Warren Mundine about the Voice. If you're participating by phone and you want to ask a question, remember to press zero on your phone keypad. Uh, I've got a, two or three more questions for Warren, then we'll, we'll throw it open to uh, people. Uh, who want to ask questions. We've got some good questions that have come through. Um, in this rather confusing landscape, there's a lot of different things that are part of it, and one of those is the Uluru Statement from the Heart. Can, can you explain what that is and how that fits in? Well, what, what happened is, it goes back to the Howard years, Howard wanted uh, to put uh, the recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the Constitution, which the vast majority of Australia, even in, in our polling from the no side, it, it's in the top 90. Yep. Everyone yep. wants to do that, really. Yep. And and then, but through these conversations, through the Howard years, the Rudd, Gillard Rudd, and then mm -hmm. Tony Abbott, and that, we had, uh, there's been this push about, okay, well, how are we going to do this? Now, I could have told, because I've been around for a long time, I could have told them what the answer was going mm -hmm. to be. Uh, when they set up a, uh, this consultation period. Now, what happened was there were 13 uh, dialogues across Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, they were by invitation only, and, and they even say it on their website and everyone else that that, that was done so they can get consensus. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when they went to Uluru, it was by that invitation process, and, uh, and they come up with the statement. And I knew that was what they were going to come up with because... Mm -hmm. uh, 
within large sections of the Aboriginal communities, there's sort of two thoughts. One is they, they, they've got equality and, and citizenship in 1967 and they want to move ahead. And the other thing is there's this uh, grievance about we need to fix uh, the issues of the past. Yes. And, and that's where it comes out. So, so yes, so the, the Uluru Statement from the Heart talks about four different things. It talks about a voice, so Aboriginal people yep. have a voice to government, which should be in the Constitution. Uh, they talk about a uh, treaty. Uh, they talk about uh, they talk about truth telling, uh, and they talk about a Makarata Commission, which is separate from the voice, that, but actually will be the one who is going to be guiding the truth telling and the treaty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Look, thank you for that um, mm -hmm. that summary. Um, now, you touched on this a bit, but. Um, both major parties support constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians, as you've just cited the figures, a very large majority yeah. of Australians support that. It's very clear to me, my constituents in Bradfield, uh, there's very strong support for a constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians. So, so why is it that we're in a position that we've got uh, differences on this particular referendum? Well, the, the differences uh, when it started in the Turnbull uh, government when uh, the report come out, mm. the, the Uluru uh, uh, statement from the heart, uh, the then the Kalma Langton uh, report, and 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 then it was glaringly uh, the, the, uh, different to what the original people thought about uh, putting a, a recognition in the constitution, and then we come up with all these uh, bureaucrats and all these. Committees and all this whole mm. setup that was coming with that, and that's when uh, the pri uh, the prime minister today, um, Malcolm Turnbull, said, "You know, this is not what we really yes. wanted." And so, um, uh, so, so that's that's where we sit today. Uh, the Labor Party said, "No, they're going to put the full vo full force of the um, Uluru statement from the heart into uh, in place." Yes. So that means voice in the constitution. Uh, we're going to have this Makarata uh, Commission, which will be, uh, which will guide the treaty process and uh, truth telling. Uh, there's no real explanation beyond that mm -hmm. uh, in in the documents, except recently there were some documents that they said from come out from from it, and there's been comments by some people on the on the Yes campaign about you're talking about reparation, you're talking about other issues. Now, for me. There were some, you know, when the Prime Minister said, well, we're not going to deal with Australia Day, we're not going to deal with that, I found that quite funny. People can argue about reparations and mm -hmm. other things, mm -hmm. but I found that funny because for the last 20 years, Australia's been arguing about yes. Australia yes. Day, so I couldn't, I couldn't see the voice not talking about that. Yes. And, then, and, of course, there's a wide range of other things. The things that concerned me the most was in regard to well, What's this treaty process? And has people, and I'll say it on records here. I've said it everywhere. I've said it on ABC this morning. I've been a, tr a, a tremendous supporter of treaties, yes. which is dealing with a traditional owner people, and and getting through that recognition and 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 it's in in their ownership of the land, and also tying up what their interest in is in regard to culture, language, uh, and management of the country. Um, so it wasn't a massive thing. Anything else like investments, mm. education, health services, that, that was still the, the, the remit of the, of the government uh, and, and working with Aboriginal peoples. So that's a concern about where is that going to head and the, and the other one which is really worries me because uh, you've got to deal with it mm. in the parliament at the moment and that is the bill in regard to uh, the uh, truth telling, misinformation yes. and, and disinformation. Uh, now to me uh, I, I, I'm very suspicious of that because the previous Labor government actually tried to do things about um, uh, free speech in regard That's to true. media. That was Stephen Conroy. Yeah, yeah Stephen Conroy did that, and so mm. that, that. So I'm saying to the government, you know, show, show to us that that isn't what it is, yes. and that we are now going to go into an, uh, an attack on free speech in this country because uh, it, the, the concern is who's going to be the arbitrator of truth. Yeah. Okay. And that is a major concern. Yeah. Okay, so you're with uh, Paul Fletcher, member for Bradfield, chatting with uh, distinguished Australian Warren Mardine, who's uh, an advocate for the uh, the no vote on the 
uh, forthcoming referendum on the Indigenous Voice to Parliament. Um, I think that's probably a good point to go to some of the questions that we've got from participants. And again, if you want to lodge a question, please press zero on your phone keyboard. It can only be done by phone. For those who are joining by uh, Facebook, you're obviously able to listen to the questions, but you do need to phone, uh, use the phone, be participating in the Telly Town Hall to lodge a question. So um, I want to go to uh, Daniel from Pimble. Um, so we're going to see if we can give Daniel the chance to speak and uh, put his question to Warren Mundine. So I'm getting a message saying, okay, Daniel, are you there and are you able to put your question? I am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mendine, I'm just curious, why do you think the question was put forward uh, for the referendum before there was cross-party support agreed on the question? I think the Previous referendums that I've seen, such as the Marriage Equality and the, and the Republic, there was a sort of cross-party position before the influential referendum. Uh, look, we, we know from you're right. We know from the history of referendums. You know, there's none that's got up. Uh, that uh, didn't have cross-party support, and, and even the uh, on from uh, the great um, uh, Robert Menzies. Uh, back in the in the late forties, when he was the leader of the opposition, he he come to an agreement with with the Chifley government about you know endowment and funding mm -hmm. and all that type of and and they and they both worked on it together uh, to get it through, and that was a, a very successful uh, referendum because both sides of politics, the coalition and the uh, and the ALP supported. Then you come back, and 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 of course uh, uh, you know. We need to think about the times in that as well, because of the communist threat in that. The, the Menzies government decided it was going to put forward a ban on the Communist Party. Uh, and, and what happened there was that the Labor Party pulled back and said, no, this is going too far, attack on, on uh, you know, freedom, liberal democracy. And, and it was interesting because that went down in flames because even a Liberal Party people and, and country party people as mm. known, then voted against that. And that was because of... And that's, I thought the, the Prime Minister would have had a lot of bit more history and common sense about it that, it, that all, this, all the uh, referendums that got up had bipartisan support uh, and they worked together. The big problem with this one, like you had, uh, was... We didn't have that uh, sort of convention and getting people coming together and discussing it. Now, and, and of course, we know that the leader of the opposition, Peter Dutton, put forward a number of questions. I think it was fifteen, mm -hmm. fifteen right. questions, yes. uh, and they were never answered. And and that's a, that's the problem. They just he kept them pushing, pushing through, and the, and the, and not talking on like I'm sound like a politician. I'll just finish <laughs> off on this point. Uh, is 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 that. Uh, uh, the opportunity for them to come together, sit down and have a conversation, then they weren't too far apart. And you see that with Peter Dutton's uh, um, announcement, you know, that, you know, he looked at regional voices, which could be set up by the parliament, and we could have a referendum where everyone would support, which is about recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So I, I think that the tactics and the, and the failure of the Prime Minister to, to look at history, it, it could come back and bite him on the bum. And the, the bad thing about that is it, it, it automatically cuts off uh, the recognition bit. And that's why it was pleasing to hear Peter Dutton come back during the week and say, no, we're going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Um, let's come to uh, Cindy from Linfield. Uh, Cindy, if you wanted to uh, ask your question of Warren Mundine. Oh, hi, um, it's Cindy. I was just wondering, a lot of people can, are confused about the percentage needed for the no vote to get up, please. Oh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a, uh, we're one of the few countries in the world, I, don't, I should say probably one of the ones, and that was uh, come out of federation because the smaller states didn't want to be dominated by the larger states like New South Wales and, and Victoria. And so they had a two part uh, to amend the constitution. The first part, you had to have a majority, uh, a national majority of voters. So that's 50 plus one 
to, uh, to get that. So once you got that, you still then had a second part because of the, the way the constitution was set up to protect the smaller states uh, was uh, that you had to get a majority of states. So uh, that meant you had to get four states out, out of the six states that are uh, part, of the, uh, part of the vote. And that's the two-part thing. So you have to get a majority. And there has some uh, been some uh, referendums that have gone down even though they had the national majority. And, uh, and there were times they, they went down when they did, and they didn't have the national majority, but they, they did have the national majority, but they didn't have the, the majority of states. Thank you for that question, uh, Cindy. I imagine probably quite a few people were wondering that. Um, so I'd like to go uh, next to Graham from Warunga. Graham, if you wanted to ask your question. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to, and I appreciate greatly uh, Warren's m and, and magnificent work in relation to opposition to the voice. Uh, I, I applaud that. Yep. My concern... Uh, I was always wondering who that supporter was. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Warren, um, what you imagine is going to be the tenor of this great country of ours in the event that the voice does not uh, get up in the uh, referendum. Are we going to see uh, people set against others? Are we going to see um, Australians against Australians, whites against Indigenous people? Is there going to be a, 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 a climate of uh, opposition for some time, which uh, really is contrary to this wonderful spirit of this country? Yeah, look... I agree. Whether it's a yes or no vote, look, I, don't, I go to bed every night currently and, and and think about that before I fall asleep about the disharmony. And unfortunately, the way it was set up, uh, the discussion and how it was going to move forward has created that disharmony already. And, and my biggest concern is as we get towards the date, especially after when the Prime Minister announces when that date is, that it could get uh, get really, really tough and rough out there. Uh, I have the trust of the Australian people uh, that we're, we're not like other countries who go around and uh, beat people up and attack people. And yes, we may do that in words, and there's been some terrible words and terrible attacks that have happened currently, uh, but I'd like to see the Prime Minister with, with the Leader of the Opposition and, that, and sort of calm that down. Uh, because it is, especially with the polling as it is, is very close. Uh, whether you believe yes is in front or no is in front or whatever, it is very uh, close, and and it, it is can be an opening sore of dis disharmony. Uh, we, we as citizens and, and Australians, we play a role in this as well, in the language and and how we uh, uh, go through the prosecuting our case. Uh, for yes or for no, uh, because it, it, I do. I've seen some of the the terrible things that have been said lately, and I and I, and I am concerned. Yeah. Um, thank you for that uh, question and that answer. I'd like to go to uh, John from Warrawee, who's got a question. Um, John, over to you. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to ask this question. Look, I'm just oh, concerned about how much, how big the voice is going to be, how much it's going to cost, how the how the members of the voice are appointed or are they elected, who does the election or the appointing, and what difference is it going to be made? Is it going to be at, at ground level or is it going to be dominated from you know people from Canberra or or from interstate from? Uh, speaking on behalf of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. That's one of the, the dilemmas of this whole debate because we don't have that information. In the beginning, the Prime Minister, every time people said we want the detail, uh, we don't know if it's going to be elected or it's going to be appointed. Uh, we, we, uh, we, when we ask about the detail, and when I say we, I'm talking about the Australian public as a whole, uh, uh, he said, well, look at the Karma Langton uh, Report and when people did that, I wrote a, a, a six 
articles for the Australian uh, critiquing uh, that and and it was a concern for me and this is one of the reasons why I you know people may remember I was working with some of the people like Professor Craven and in, in, in the in the upper hold and, and recognized group but when I started seeing uh, that it was going to be a huge bureaucracy and and they're looking and in fact it says in the report they're looking at a non-electoral process I couldn't see how pe voices on the ground could actually fall into that mm. process and so uh, that's when I backed off and, I, and, I've, and I've now moved to the to the no side the the issue is um, we don't know because now the Prime Minister is saying relax it's going to be the details are going to be spilt out, you know, after the referendum. So it's almost like you've got to vote for the referendum on on trust and that. And then and we and look, uh, uh, in the way the prime minister has been operating recently, I, I don't have that trust. Uh, I I I want him to, to give us that trust uh, because, as you said, the earlier question earlier was about disharmony and problems that could happen in that in the community. Uh, because and we're a democracy, so whatever the vote is at the end of the day, we should respect that vote. We've seen overseas what happens when people don't respect that vote, uh, but but we have no idea. No one can point to anything uh, in regard to what the government is looking at uh, for 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 the, what is it's going to be elected or non-elected, whether it's going to be uh, a whole row at right. How many people are there? We we saw in the Karma Langton report is something like 24 people, but now they say, well, how can you say 24 people? We haven't decided mm -hmm. on that, mm -hmm. and so you don't know what's going to happen. So it, it, so that that's. And that's why I'm a great believer you're dealing with the Constitution, which is the basis of our law, and, and, and we're dealing with a liberal demo, democratic Constitution, is, which is so important for us, which gives us the institutions and gives us the, the, the processes for, for doing law in a de very democratic way. I, I don't know how it's going to operate. They, uh, remember the Minister for Indigenous Australians made the comment, well, it's like the High Court, you don't get a... A complete sheet of the High Court about how it operates and that, but but we had history about it. So f coming from England, we we inherited inherited the English legal system. They've had a, a High Court for 500 years, so we knew how it was operating. We knew what it, how it worked. Uh, then we also knew the Americans when uh, they had a Supreme Court. Uh, uh, what a hundred and something years of the Supreme Court when we did our federation so we knew how that Supreme Court works as well as the, at the colonies I should call them in those days now the states the colonies had their own Supreme Court so we knew how that operates no country in the world has a voice uh, so we don't we don't know what it is we don't know how it's going to operate let's come to uh, Diane from North Taramara um, Diane you will be able to ask your question I think now so over to you Well, hi there. Thank you for taking my call. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Thanks for for your question. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my my question is that currently the budget has allowed 4.2 million dollars billion dollars yeah. average per year to Aboriginal funding for uh, communities and programs. Where I believe that the Yes campaign will mean more money, but where is that four billion dollars per year going at the moment? Well, th that's that's the uh, sixty-four dollar question, or, or four point two billion dollar question. <laughs> it is uh, look, we, we know where the, some of the money is going, and in fact, the Productivity Commission uh, come out two weeks ago, three weeks ago. I, I stand to be corrected on it, but it was about two or three weeks ago, and it said. Um, and it said about you know 37 percent of that budget actually actually gets out to on the ground with Aboriginal people. So that's 63 percent of that budget is spent uh, within the bureaucracy and within uh, within Canberra and the larger cities like Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth, and that. And so we've got a very limited amount of money getting out uh, to those uh, to those communities. Uh, so that's that's one of the 
big problems in it, and I raised it in regard to accountability. Surely, you know, like if I was running my businesses, where we were only getting 37% of our money out to mm. our customers, I'd be, <laughs> uh, I'd be bankrupt actually. Mm. <laughs> so that's so we need to, and it's not about blaming people or attacking people. It's just a common sense economic issue about we need to get that funds out there to deal with these 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 dreadful issues we see on our tellies and in the newspapers. You're with uh, Paul Fletcher, member for Bradfield, and Warren Mundine, chatting about The Voice. Um, if you want to ask a question, if you're participating in the Tele Town Hall, you can do so by pressing zero on your phone. Uh, let's come to Susan from Roseville. Uh, and Susan, I think you should be able to ask your question question now. So over to Susan. Hi Warren, thank you very much for your sensible input to these issues. Thank um, you. My concern is that I do believe that all Australians should be equal under the Constitution. And given that Mr Dutton is now seems to be supportive of a legislative voice both regional and Commonwealth, why do you think it is that uh, the Labor Party is not considering legislating the voice so that it can be amended and outcomes can be assessed? I, I, I have enough problems in getting into my own thinking <laughs> in my brain, so I'm not going to go into the brain of the Prime Minister. That's mm. a, a bit of a journey for me. Uh, look, the reality is that they're not going to do it. They, they uh, uh, Unless some miracle happens leading up to October, whenever the referendum has. My, uh, it, 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 it's a sensible approach. Uh, the, uh, the Constitution gives the power to the, to the legislator, which is the Parliament, to uh, make those calls today. Uh, I don't know why they don't do it, or they, or even restructure the way some of the uh, bodies are operating today, and, and I, even the, uh, putting accountability into that process and that is well outcome driven. Uh, you know, like I always say, look, uh, and I'm just using this as an argument, and I'm not a doctor, so some doctor will bring up and say I'm wrong, uh, is that, um, you know, if, if you've got a community and measles is the problem, then, and then you ask, well, how long is... Uh, how long does it take to get rid of measles and let's say for argument's sake it's seven years and we can fund that and work on it and make those bodies that are put in charge of that have that seven year outcome uh, but at the, at the moment it, it, it is swallowed up by a lot of bureaucracy and, 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 in, and as I said I'm not blaming people and that I, I just want it to be fixed uh, I, don't, uh, I just want it, uh, that money, the, most of that money getting out into those communities so thank you, Susan, for that question. Let's come to Helen from St Ives. Hi, thank you very much for um, posting this and getting involved in it, Warren. It's, it's um, thank you. very much appreciated. Um, my question follows a bit more from the previous one. As you were saying, the government can legislate a whole lot of changes Right, the referendum costs a heck of a lot of money. Besides not easily reversing um, some of the decisions that come with the voice referendum, what are the other repercussions? Uh, look, the um, the repercussions uh, is, is afterwards is, is my concern, isn't it? And it is about uh, the yes and no campaign, and this is why I made the commitment that. We're in a democracy. Whatever happens, the people have voted and people have made their choice and, and we need to live with that and work together to move forward on, on those issues. Uh, look, um, I don't think I fully answered the, the last question. The, the, the issue is, is that the government has fully signed up to, to the Uluru Statement from the Heart uh, they uh, the the repercussions of that is is that we are putting an advisory council calling it the voice within the constitution that gives it uh, a bit of oomph with the constitutional uh, stuff and it also opens it up to high court uh, people going to the high court and we won't know whether that whether 
is going to happen then until it actually happens. Whether the High Court accepts certain challenges or not, that will be a decision of the High Court. And and also if they do accept them, what is going to be the, the decision of those things. So we won't know any of that stuff. So And, and it could be a whole wide range of issues. I, 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 I'm really... There's two issues that really come out. One is they sh should have worked a lot closer and a lot better and, and had conversations with the coalition and, and you know and don't leave the the, uh, the cross benches and that could they should have had those conversations a lot better uh, and come out with a be a better more successful way of doing things uh, but uh, they, they decided not to do that. And, and of course, then they've just and when you know we had Mark Dreyfus, who's the Attorney General, when he tried to get, and we all know this because of the leaks from the mm. the, the design committee, yeah. and he tried to get, and he's he's our top outside of the, the the judiciary, he's our top lawmaker. He he tried to get him to change, but he, he uh, uh, the Prime Minister said no, we're going to go and force it through. So these are the problems that we're, we're stuck with. I'm hoping that some sort of common sense starts coming through and, and we have those conversations of, and bring the country back together and bring the parliament back together about what they can do to move forward. I don't know what that's going to be. I'm not a magician, uh, but I'm hoping that can happen and I'm hoping that uh, that we can that people do settle down and, and, and the Prime Minister needs to do this too because some of the insults that are coming is coming from his own mouth is that he needs to settle down to and just prosecute the case, prosecute their arguments, uh, which is what you do in a, in a democracy, and then people can make up their own mind. A, a very, very comprehensive answer. Um, I wanted to come to uh, the, uh, I think, from Roseville. Um, if we could just go down the screen a bit, just talking to my assistant here. Um, well, yeah, Richard from Roseville has an interesting question. So, uh, Richard, over to you. Yeah, hello, yes. I'm following this with interest, but I lack detailed knowledge of things. I'm interested in the fact that the South Australian government has passed or is in the process of passing something somewhat similar to what is suggested for the voice, but they're doing it without changing the constitution. I wonder if Mr Mundine could clarify whether that's a suitable way to go or what the differences might be. Uh, you're correct. Uh, it, is, it was a legislative process. It didn't change the constitution. Uh, you know, in, in New South, I'll, I'll go to New South Wales here. New South Wales uh, did change their constitution, but it was about recognition. Mm. That they put that through. There was no arguments. There's no debates. The sky hasn't fallen in, and people have moved on. Uh, the uh, Peter Malanakis, I, I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, he got me to do the inquiry into adult prisons and, and reoffending in South Australia uh, back when he was the Corrective Services uh, Minister in the previous government. Uh, he, he, he was he he. he he just did it by legislation, mm. and and that was it. You know, uh, the interesting thing, and you know, because it, and of course it shows how how uh, Peter Malinakis has got a bit more of a brain. He he also uh, delayed it until after the referendum because <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to see it interfere with the, the referendum as what we saw in Western Australia with the, the Aboriginal Heritage Act. Uh, so uh, yeah. The answer is a very short, even though I've been going on forever, I think, uh, the answer is very short and sweet. It is, it is, a, it is a, uh, a legislative approach, and, and same with Victoria, that's a legislative approach as well as, as New South Wales, and, it's, uh, and, and we'll see what happens at the end of the day. It's, it wasn't a constitutional thing. You're listening uh, to the Bradfield Telly Town Hall. I'm Paul Fletcher, member for Bradfield. I'm chatting with Warren Mundine about The Voice, and we've got uh, we've had quite a few questions come through. There's still a few minutes left. Uh, if you want to ask a question, press zero on your handset to do that. Um, I'd like to come to Peter from Kalara. Uh, hi, 
platform. Correct. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, if I could just ask Warren to address a, a couple of things. Uh, uh, we're being told this is all about inadequate consultation, and uh, I'm just wondering why the bureaucrats in the minister's office, are, you know, are, why are they not getting out of their comfortable Canberra and, and running some decent consultation programs out in the out in the bush? Um, you know, that's what we have to do for big infrastructure projects. Uh, go and talk to local people. So I really can't see why they couldn't be doing that. That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is this. Um, the, no, the no case is not really yet countering what I see as the emotional blackmail of, of uh, the yes case saying this is the last chance to, that we've got to do anything. If this fails, then it's all over Rover. That really doesn't seem to be uh, the case to me at all. Yeah. Uh, uh, dealing with the first question, um, I'll make a declaration that I'm a chairman of a exploration and mining company. We've got three mines in uh, Australia, two in West Australia, two, one in um, uh, Queensland. Uh, we can't do anything on our mine sites without uh, sitting down and having consultations, having negotiations and coming to an agreement with the local Aboriginal people. I can't see why that wasn't the process that they they didn't use for for the for the for the beginning of, of, of the discussions about the Uluru statement from the uh, from the heart. That would have been a better process because you know I, you know I, as being in that industry, I deal with Aboriginal communities virtually every day of the week, and and and, and deal with their issues and, and and what the legislation and everything does. And I find that when you sit, sit down with the groups and, and they have their own advisors and legal people and we have ours and we sit down and we have those conversations and have and cups of tea together, I, we have good outcomes, uh, good outcomes for the Aboriginal people about their protection of their cultural heritage as well as jobs and, and training as well as having some businesses and that working on, on our sites. Uh, and, 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 and the benefits that come out of, the, out of our mining activity and, and exploration activity that, will, that goes into those Aboriginal community people's hands. I don't know why they didn't use that approach in, in the beginning. I, I just, you know, I just only can use their words, which was they decided to do, have invitations, uh, uh, which was getting a consensus of people to come. Uh, you know, I, I'm sure I'm sure there's a, the Liberal Party would like to have that everyone mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and the Labor Party mm -hmm. I think does mm -hmm. some of that. You, you, you know, they would. Uh, I think it would have been a better outcome uh, for everyone involved. Uh, in regard to the second part of your question, I'm just trying to looking at Paul to remember. Uh, did you want to uh, perhaps uh, repeat that, Peter? The second part of the question. I don't know if I can get to um, We might see if we can bring Peter back up again. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Well, we might have to go yeah. on to. Um, yeah, to sorry about that. that that's all right. Yeah. Uh, uh, but what we will be doing is taking note of the questions that we haven't got to, and we'll be responding after after this uh, tele town hall. I want to go to Matthew and St Ives, and I know he's been waiting quite a while. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Brilliant. Um, here's my question. Conceivably in the future, be that in a hundred or a thousand years, we will eventually achieve some form of reconciliation. If this is the overall aim, many have said we will achieve that through voice, truth-telling and treaty. As the no side, you must disagree with that, at least in part. So what then, in your opinions, are the end goals of the reconciliation process and how should we achieve them? Well, I think we're, we're well on the way uh, uh, to, to doing that. Yeah, I look at the 1967 referendum. I'm of that old age that uh, I was a child during that referendum and my older brothers and sisters and my parents worked on it. And, uh, and, and it was about equality. It was, uh, it was about full citizenship. Yes, we had citizenship right. Uh, we were citizens, but we were second-class citizens because the states and territories were in charge of the laws in regard affecting Aboriginal people, and that's why the constitution was changed in '67, so that the federal government can have a, a say in the, that process as as well. And so, so 
within four to five years of that referendum, all the state uh, discriminatory laws against Aboriginals were gone. Uh, they were all gone, and then the federal government, working with the state, especially in education, one thing we've got to recognise too, that the states control most of this area, health, education, mm-hmm. housing, and, and so on. And we saw that within the, uh, uh, the COVID uh, uh, that happened recently. Uh, so so the, it, the, the, they had Aboriginal uh, education programs, they had uh, health, uh, Aboriginal medical service, all this stuff set up and, and we were moving ahead. Uh, the, the issue I see is that, uh, we, uh, uh, is that we're treating all Aboriginals the same. Uh, that with this homoge- homogeneous group of people. Well, you know, I, I don't want to boast here, but you know, when you're sitting as a chairman of a, a exploration and mining company, you, you, you're in a pretty good position. Noel Pearson's in a pretty good mm. position. Professor Megan Ash. So we've got a lot of Aboriginals who are doing quite well and moving forward. 42 point, I think, no, no, 43. 43.2% of Aboriginals own their own home. So they're doing quite well. The problem we're having, is, and this is, is that we should be focusing on the people of need, mm-hmm. the people who are in, in, having problems, and work with them. And, and you know, in regard, and it, we we see it all the time. We see the crime rates. We see the kids not going to school. We see the, the social issues that are in those communities, and that's what we we got to work with those people, and help them, and 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 and, 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 and move forward. And, and through that process, as I said, from the '67 referendum, we, uh, you know, yes, we we have races living in Australia, but they're such a tiny minority. Uh, we've been such a successful country in bring, uh, bringing just about every race in the world living in this country, multiracial, multi-faith. We've got all these people who are, you know, for all these different religions and different faith, faith, and we even got, we even got uh, atheists. And we've got them all, and, and we've got all these multicultural stuff. Gee, when I used to go to the, go to the milk bars when I was a kid, now I go to the, the cafes and get my smashed abo and coffee <laughs> and everything like that. It's just been... So, and we've done that. Yeah, so now and again we have a bit of a punch-up. But it's not like France went through just recently with the riots and burning down places. It was not like uh, what's happening in the United States where you get you know, the, the, the black life movement, Black Lives Matter, matter. Yeah. and it's, so we're doing very, very well, and, 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 and I, I think we're one, you know, despite what some of my American friends say, I think we've been the most successful country in the world in regard to, in, in regard to li- keeping our liberal democracy and the rights of people and keep, and, and the citizenship of equality, and, uh, and, and, and you, whether you've been a, a, a citizen for, for 30 seconds or you've been here for you know, 60,000 years, you're, still, you're all equal and you're all treated equal before the law. Uh, when is reconciliation going to end? Uh, I think we're well on that journey now that it's going, it's, it's, it's going to end. Well, look, uh, thank you, Warren, for that answer and thank you for all of your answers. And can I thank everybody who has participated Uh, tonight. We've had very good participation. We've had a range of good questions. The questions we haven't been able to answer, uh, we're going to take a note of them and we will come back to you by email uh, with a response. Can I remind you that we have coming up um, uh, in uh, about three weeks time, I'm just checking to be reminded of the exact date, but we have another session which will be uh, the, the 31st of August. Thank you. 31st of August uh, I'll be having a similar chat with Julian Lisa, who's an advocate for the Yes campaign. But can I thank everybody who's been involved in the discussion tonight. Warren, um, can I ask, uh, ask you this question in closing? I think a big theme in the questions tonight was um, how can we be satisfied that the work that needs to continue to be done to address Indigenous advantage is going to continue to be done no matter the outcome? Of course it is. It's, it's, it's this, and I, I say the word nonsense in, in that uh, reconciliation is going to stop. Australian people, as I say, since 1967 and post Second World War, have been working forward, and you know, and in, in, in really becoming a multi-pluralist society, and 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 we can thank that 
to our structures of, of our legal systems and our democracy uh, that has uh, that has made that achievable and so uh, I, um, I I think that the, the country is uh, in, a, in a great place and and whatever and this is uh, whatever the decision of the people out there that was this is a great thing about the democracy I, uh, even whether you agree with it or not the people always get it right and so, uh, you know, I will work and I will continue to work for that to happen. And I can't see any of our fellow Australians turning their back on that. I'm, look, I'm sure there's going to be one or two people out there on the fringes, but the vast majority of Australians will, will still put their shoulders to the grinding stone and, Good. and uh, move forward. Well, look, that's a good note to end on. Thank you very much, Warren Mundine. Thank you, everybody, who's participated. That brings to an end tonight's Bradfield Telly Town Hall on The Voice to Parliament. And uh, come back on the 31st of August for the next one in our series, which will feature Julian Lisa. Thank you very much, Warren Thank Mundine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, people.